his presidency. Sources say Special Prosecutor Kenneth Starr has subpoenaed Secret Service agents to testify about the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Secret Service agents on the stand, it is simply unheard of. Let's Trent now with the story. He is surrounded by them day and night, and when it comes to the president, they are best known for keeping their eyes open and their mouths shut. Secret Service agents are the classic strong silent types, a reputation that could crumble if they are called to testify in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Former Secret Service agent Richard Boondorf served under Presidents Bush and Clinton and is fiercely loyal to the code of silence. It would be disgusting for an agent the thought of having to talk about something that they, you know, have overheard, you know, on their, doing their professional duties. I think it's deplorable. It is the ultimate irony, the very men who put themselves in the line of fire for the President of the United States, suddenly expected to open fire verbally at the nation's Commander-in-Chief. And ironically, a search for truth could weaken the very purpose of the Secret Service. If an agent's forced to testify, anybody that's receiving our protection is going to start to question how close do they want them and then that's going to compromise our security. How serious is the Secret Service about its code of silence? Consider this. For 35 years, former agent Anthony Sherman kept quiet about the steamy goings-on he'd reportedly witnessed at the JFK White House before finally telling his story in this book. We, we used to come into the White House and uh, say, What's, where's the president? Uh, particularly in the morning shift, we, and he's upstairs. And, and, you know, we'd look at each other and shrug because that meant that he was not alone. If Sherman thought it was safe to speak out, he was dead wrong. He was promptly reprimanded by the Secret Service, along with other agents who spoke out. I'm dumbfounded. It's, it's very disturbing, personally to me. He'll get no sympathy from this former agent, who believes that Secret Service silence was golden back then and should not be tarnished now. This is something that should remain his personal life, and we should look at the office as, uh, is he doing his job? Here's some information on the Secret Service. It has been around since 1865 and has been assigned to protect the president since 1901, that following the assassination of President William McKinley. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. It brings up a lot of important questions. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with MTV's answer to the State of the Union. Amir Day was a resident Clinton today in the African nation of Ghana. Amir Day was a resident Clinton today in the African nation of Ghana. An unruly crowd rushed him, and the president had to take control to protect himself and several others. News Channel 5's Marion Brooks joins us now with the story. Marion? Allison, the situation looked potentially dangerous, but was it? Despite the throngs of people pressing to get to the president, one former Secret Service agent says the president was safe. Great. Hundreds of thousands turned out at a rally in Ghana to honor the president. It doesn't appear that the people wish him any harm, but like excited crowds at a rock concert, they do seem capable of causing great harm. And the president looks quite uncomfortable. There was, probably was a little bit of concern just to the fact that the media, or that the people were being pressed up against the president. Some of the barricades had given way, and, and that's why there were so many people pushed up. Uh, in situations like that, it's a judgment call. Richard Boondorf is a former Secret Service agent who guarded Clinton as he ran for office in 1992. He watched the tape of the president as he made his way through the people in Ghana. And despite the anxious crowd, the throngs of people reaching out to touch the president, Boondorf doesn't think the president was in any danger. Well, there's contingency plans that are in place, and uh, the agents are uh, surrounding him in a protective capacity where if, uh, if the crowd started to push too, too much further, I think that they would have uh, activated their contingency plans. From my perspective, uh, I felt like the president was surrounded <laughs> with enough security. Now, Boondorf wouldn't tell us what those contingency plans might be, but he did say there are more agents there than it seems. Some of the Secret Service agents don't fit the stereotype of the suit and the sunglasses that you see. Some are in place specifically to blend into the crowd. Mark? Marianne, thank you. Patrick Quinn, the Democrat. Channel 5 at 4. A major blow for President Bill Clinton today in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. We'll take you live to Washington at all this weekend. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Meaden for Allison Rosati tonight. And I'm Mark Sapelsa. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Meaden for Allison Rosati tonight. And I'm Mark Sapelsa. For the first time in American history, Secret Service agents are forced to testify in an investigation about a president. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court stepped into the showdown between Canada Star 
and the agency and the Secret Service lost. News Channel 5's Steve Handelsman has it live now from Washington. Steve? Good evening, Mark. Well, here at the White House tonight, they're continuing to insist that this is a fight merely about principle, that in fact, they say, no employee of the Secret Service has ever seen or heard anything that could hurt President Clinton. Maybe, but now Ken Starr gets to be the judge of that. We're gone, we're switched. At mid-afternoon, lead agent Larry Cockle was set to become the first Secret Service employee in history to testify against the president he's sworn to protect. He's a law enforcement official. He will tell the truth, and there is no question about that. Cockle had come to the courthouse this morning with half a dozen uniformed Secret Service officers, not knowing if the Supreme Court would block their subpoenas from Ken Starr. At noon, with several justices out of the country, Chief Justice Rehnquist ruled by himself in refusing to stop Secret Service testimony. The administration had argued that if agents reveal what they overhear at the president's side, he won't let them so close and will be more at risk. Mr. Clinton himself backed that view this morning. This was a decision that came out of the Secret Service about which they feel very strongly. And these people uh, risk their lives to protect me. We're trying to but Kenneth Starr had already countered with a clever promise not to question Clinton agents about what they see or hear on protective detail from now on until the Supreme Court rules on the whole issue. Siding with Starr, Rehnquist wrote, disclosure of past events will not affect the president's relationship with his protectors in the future. His victory won, Starr quickly moved to question Cockrell's comrades. With the regular Whitewater Lewinsky grand jury off duty, Starr called three Secret Service employees before another grand jury that happened to be handy. When Cockle himself is called, a likely question will be, what did he hear the president say to his lawyers and advisors last January on the way back from the deposition in the Paula Jones case where Mr. Clinton was blindsided with questions about Monica Lewinsky? How did it go? Cockle's lawyer says that's exactly the kind of question the former lead agent might try to refuse to answer. And here, the president's people continue to insist that one Ken Starr is essentially trying to do is use the Secret Service to eavesdrop on the privileged conversations of the president. I'm Steve Handelsman, News Channel 5, reporting live from the White House. Mark right, and Robin, back Steve, to you. thank you for that report. Former Secret Service agent now living in Chicago has some pretty strong feelings about today's decision. Richard Buendorf Jr. served during both the Clinton and Bush administrations. He thinks this was the wrong time to force the Secret Service issue. But my feeling is is that uh, asking an agent to testify over an issue uh, that most the American public, I think, find not a relative issue to national security is, is really pathetic. I think that uh, it's definitely going to hinder security in the future as it relates to this president, future presidents, uh, foreign heads of state that require our protection. Now, you know, they've established that uh, there are no boundaries here. And I think that ha they should have established that uh, there are, the boundaries are of national security. And uh, issues uh, such as whether or not uh, money is coming through to the president from China is an issue of national security. If an agent had to be forced to testify on that, that would make sense to me. Specifically, Buendorf feels the investigation is a case of tax dollars being wasted in Cockle's old job. Those who have been called to testify are those who have been called to testify are on leave. The agents are going to be truthful with their answers. When they're asked to testify, if they know, they're going to answer. Unfortunately, there's an inbred feeling within the agents that complete truth is the only thing that they can really bring to the table. There is such a thing as being in the wrong place at the wrong time, especially if the Secret Service is nearby. Stacy Sweet tells us about one young man who was waiting for a date and ended up in the government computer. It's common knowledge that wherever the president is, the Secret Service is not too far away. And, of course, the same holds true for his daughter, Chelsea. Anything that looks strange is sure to be looked into quickly by the first family's protectors. 28-year-old MTV writer Tom Cohen is one person who looks strange to the Secret Service. Suddenly, I had a relationship with the Secret Service. A relationship that began while he was anxiously waiting for a date. Tom was walking around and looking for her outside this bookstore near the Stanford University campus in Palo Alto, California, when the university's most famous student, Chelsea Clinton, went inside. 
I sort of looked her in the eye when she walked by, and I sort of thought to myself, well, that's cool. But for Tom Cohen, the chance meeting quickly became a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I had absolutely no idea that she would be there. But the Secret Service wasn't so sure. To them, Tom was a potential stalker. Alone, waiting, and pacing around in front of the store, he alarmed Chelsea's protectors. But for someone who has never even seen the Secret Service, Tom himself was now getting suspicious. It occurred to me that, you know, maybe they're looking at me, and then I thought, they probably are. I mean, that's what they do, but I never assumed they'd talk to me or, or come up to me and approach me. Tom gave up waiting for his date and started walking towards a diner across the street. He heard footsteps closely behind him when suddenly a Secret Service agent told him to back off. Minutes later, another agent sat down and questioned him while he was eating. Secret Service accosted me and interrogated me and, and wondered what I was doing there and why I was pacing around the bookstore. In front of the Borders bookstore in New York City, Tom showed me exactly what he was doing that made the Secret Service so interested in him. Do you think anything you did that day could have been construed as suspicious? Yeah, I mean, I definitely was loitering around outside a bookstore. I was walking in and out, looking at my watch. I guess that's sort of normal behavior, but when you're in one place for an hour, I guess that's quote-unquote suspicious. In order to protect Chelsea, the Secret Service basically has to evaluate every single place that she travels. The Secret Service looks at each situation as a peril, which makes me situation as a peril, which makes me, Arlene, the only person in the state of Maryland to simultaneously kneel in four counties. I feel very distinctive. Which is temporary compared to Arlene Sneed's life in this with the conversation in a diner. The Secret Service ran a background check on the car he was driving. It belonged to his brother David, who Tom was in California visiting. This note was placed on his brother's door. Would like to speak to you regarding your brother's visit to Palo Alto. A member of the Secret Service called me to ask me about why my brother was hanging out and looking peculiar in Palo Alto. And embarrassingly enough, they also called the girl who stood Tom up. If it means better security for the president and his family than I can deal with a few days of inconvenience. In fact, Tom's a pretty good sport and says his brush with Chelsea Clinton and the scary encounter with the Secret Service was the highlight of his trip. I don't mind being interrogated by the Secret Service, but don't stand me up. <laughs> don't wait an hour for it to show up either. When we asked Tom about how his being in the government files affected him, he said he didn't really mind. It was worth the story he had to tell. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Two things up front. Did you know that some very prominent black leaders are fighting scholarships for black children to attend public schools, private schools, I should say, optional scholarships? Nobody's forcing anybody to leave public schools, but why is this happening? We are working on that story, and we'll have it for you later on this week. Secondly, this might be a good time to review the president's situation since the investigation is entering its final phase. That's our Talking Points memo this evening. President Clinton is under suspicion in three main areas. First, that he committed perjury in the Paula Jones deposition. Second, that he subverted the 1996 election by soliciting illegal campaign funds. And third, that he gave China technology that can be used militarily against the USA. That's the crux of the president's situation. There is no question in my mind that Attorney General Reno is helping President Clinton stonewall the investigations. Others believe this as well, including the New York Times. I believe Ms. Reno will go down in history beside John Mitchell as an Attorney General who put politics above the law. Finally, the Secret Service testimony. According to new Fox News Opinion Dynamics poll, 36% of Americans believe agents should testify about the President, but 57% say they should not. 7% are not sure. And that leads us to tonight's top story, the continuing uproar over the Secret Service. Joining us now from Chicago is a former Secret Service agent. Richard Boondorf was with that agency for six years before leaving to join the private sector. He provided security for President Clinton during the 1992 campaign. When you were providing security for the president, Mr. Boondorf, did you get close to him personally? Were you friendly with him? Well, whenever he's not, uh, whenever he has downtime, I mean, often he'll come and just talk to the agents just because, uh, you know, we are in touch with what's going on outside of politics. All right, so basically uh, there was some socializing going on 
between you, other agents, and the president. That's natural. You guys spend a lot of time with him. When you were socializing, though, it, it wasn't on a uh, more than a casual basis, right? He wasn't discussing uh, problems of the world with you guys, was he? No, not at all. No. Okay, that fact, never happened. No, and you're very careful as an agent, especially uh, with your peers, because you don't want to even appear that you're trying to buddy up with the president. Uh, you know, if a supervisor thinks you're getting too close to the president or to a protectee, they'll they'll make it an issue and uh, talk with you about it. Because we're we're not there to uh, be their friend; we're there just to protect them. That's our job. All right. So no brown nosing of the president, then. That's yeah. That's it does not... take place, but uh, we're very cautious of it. Right? All right. Now, when you are near the president, when he is out uh, campaigning in 92, when you were there, um, were you, did you overhear conversations that perhaps you should not have overheard you personally? Well, I think that the, I overheard conversations that didn't relate to anything uh, revolving around security. Uh, so certainly we were privy to conversations that uh, I didn't want to listen to. Uh, and I can give you a quick example. I was. Uh, one minute, uh, one day I was in with uh, Vice President Quayle listening to his chief of staff talk about their uh, political strategy. And the very next day I was driving the limo for Bill and Hillary, and they were t discussing theirs. And so that's kind of one of the things that, you know, as an agent, you're listening to the radio and you're listening to supervisors telling you what's happening. And you're listening to the police radios uh, as, the, as the motorcycles are passing by. But in inevitably, conversations do uh, come our way where we listen and and you overhear things that have no relation to your job. We had uh, former presidential advisor Dick Morris on the broadcast last week, and he said that President Clinton was very aware, in fact, told him on a number of occasions to be quiet around Secret Service agents when they were discussing delicate matters about strategy or personal matters. That makes sense to you? Right. I would think that that would be normal. I mean, it's not uncommon that um, once he's in a protective environment, he does uh, make note that he would like to be alone. Sure, and it makes sense to everybody. So why then, why then, this outcry about the Secret Service going in to testify in front of the grand jury? Well, Bill, as you know, that uh, the Secret Service elected to, they're, they're, they have to protect the president. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat. So they really don't have a political uh, agenda within the Secret Service. And one of the problems here is that Congress forces the Secret Service by law to be that close to the president. And he doesn't have an option. When he was governor, he could tell the uh, state police that he wanted his privacy to go away. But as uh, president of the United States, the American public and the Congress, by law, require us to be in the close proximity. And as as well the they should. As right. well they should. But, but right. I'm, see, I'm not getting why this is a problem. If you are um, uh, commanded to be in his presence, if you, are, if you have to be near him, he knows that. He knows that you're there. It's not like you're invisible or that you're sneaking around the corner. So whatever he says is a matter of public record, in my estimation. So I don't understand what the big brouhaha is about you guys going in testifying in front of a grand jury. Well, look, we're, you know, we're not there to be informants for, um, you know, a political interest group. We're there. Whoa, whoa, do... whoa, whoa, whoa! This is a grand jury. This isn't the Republican convention. This is a grand jury looking into a possible crime. Well, I think that there's allegations both ways, and I think from... It doesn't matter, though, uh, Mr. Boondorf. It doesn't matter what the allegations are. The facts are this is a legitimate federal grand jury under a legitimate prosecutor. That's their constitution. That's the law. I, I, I think that you can argue it, you know, black or white, that, yes, that's true, it is the law, and if he did create... If he did, uh, uh, you know, lie on the stand, that uh, that's perjury, and we need to investigate that. But. But realistically here, Bill, I mean, you're not talking about whether or not the president received money from China. I mean, if he received money from China and they were asking an agent or during the Iran-Contra situation, they were asking an agent to testify what they overheard, that might make some sense to me. because But it's you in don't the know what the they're going to ask. Public. You don't know. I don't know. They may ask any questions they want about China. We don't know. It's the press that's driving this sex deal. We'll have more with Mr. Boondorf in a moment, and I'll let you comment on that. And we also have another entire segment with him. And also coming up, former Senator Eugene McCarthy wants to abolish the special prosecutor statute. We'll confront him about that. And after a two years, we still don't know definitely what caused TWA 800 to explode. There's a lot of anger about that. Also, he was expelled from school, asked to leave the Army, and generally made a mess of things. How then did Robert Guillaume, the man who played Benson, become a star? We'll find out, and we hope you stay tuned. Continuing now with former Secret Service. 
Continuing now with former Secret Service agent Richard Boondorf, who provided security for President Clinton in 1992, six years with the Secret Service Agency. You know, it's a shame that President Clinton is being investigated at all, and I say that with, uh, with all sincerity. Uh, people think that uh, journalists like me, who are as aggressive in this matter, uh, we're taking glee and joy in President Clinton's predicament. We're not. Uh, at least I'm not. I really think this is a shame for the United States. That being said, does that worry you um, if the Secret Service say that the courts did rule against them um, and, and they didn't have to testify? Wouldn't it worry you that a president then could, could be committing a crime or, or doing things against the republic and you guys would just have to sit there mute? Wouldn't that worry you? Are you talking to me? Yeah, Mr. Boone. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I can't. We're federal agents. I mean, there's not going to be an illegal activity that takes place. If the president were dealing cocaine, we would report it. We have a standard order of procedure that we follow. I mean, this isn't something that uh, the agents take lightly. They're, they're very much dedicated to doing what's right in the best interest of the American public. Then, that being said, and I believe that, I believe if the president was doing cocaine or counterfeiting or whatever he's doing illegally, you guys would report it. If that's being said, aren't you concerned that maybe he did break the law? You certainly don't know all the pieces to the puzzle, nor do I. Right. Then, but that your testimony or another one of the agent's testimony could provide evidence in a larger mosaic that would prove the president of the United States committed a crime. Whether you think the crime's important or not really isn't an issue here. No, that's true, but I think that uh, it should have been more defined as far as what role or in what capacity they would use Secret Service testimony. Why? Court. Why does it have to be publicly defined when uh, Judge Starr can, can bring his information to the federal judges who rule? Why don't you have confidence in the system? I guess that is what I'm asking. Well, part of the problem is, is, is just what happened like in 1963 with, uh, with Kennedy. I mean, he requested Secret Service be further away. And until a tragedy happens, uh, the Sur Secret Service doesn't even have the political clout to justify being that close to the president. It's taken this long and through ver a variety of incidences that have happened that have gotten us the ability to be that close. You, you know, a, an attack on a protectee happens so fast and it's so unpredictable that you really you need to be within inches of the protectee and at times when they need their space you make, you know, you make the adjustments as necessary. But it's just you don't want to be out there thinking about uh, that you couldn't be next to him because you might have to testify. But you shouldn't there. have to think about that. That shouldn't ever enter your mind. It should be you doing your job protecting the president, and if you overhear something, you overhear something. It's the president's responsibility to conduct himself um, as a uh, responsible person, not yours. Right, See, I'm not, I'm not getting the conflict here. I would have ruled right down the line the Secret Service have to come in and testify. I would have done it if I were the judge. Well, and you know, until you have the Secret Service walking you to the bathroom and walking you to your car and with you, every room you go into,